Uh, namaste to all of you and thank you for joining today. Uh, first of all, I am very sorry for the delay. There was an unexpected technical problem. And uh, on behalf of the Center for Indic Studies, Indus University, Ahmedabad, and the Gandhi Research Foundation, Jalgaon, I welcome you all to this special webathon, which is spread over a series of uh, one year. It's spread over one year. It is designed to celebrate the birth centenary of Sri Dharampalji whose dates are 1922 to 2006. Uh, this event is being organized in collaboration with various national institutions, uh, including the IGNCA, ICHR, the ICSSR, and ICPR. Today is the fourth in a series of monthly webinars that began in July of this year, and that will run through the course of one year. Each of these monthly webinars are centered on various important works that are authored by Sri Dharampalji. Today's, uh, the topic for today's webinar is civil disobedience and the Indian tradition, uh, historical significance and contemporary implications. This is based on Dharampalji's work with the same title, Civil Disobedience and the Indian Tradition that was published in 1971. To speak on this topic, we have with us uh, Professor Satish Jain, who's retired professor from JNU, and Professor Sambhu Prasad, who's from the Institute of Rural Management in Anand. Uh, we have with us Professor Geeta Dharampalji, who is the daughter of Sri Dharampalji. And uh, uh, she, because of some uh, technical problem at her end, uh, she will not be able to uh, switch on her video. So she'll be available on audio only. Uh, I invite now Professor Geeta Dharampalji to introduce uh, the session and the speakers to the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ankur Kakar, and my most cordial greetings to you all, uh, also on behalf of the GRF, uh, to all members of our audience, and especially to our two speakers, Professor Satish Jain and Professor Shambhu Prasad. We are doubly privileged today to be having two professors as speakers. But our grateful uh, appreciation to all of you for gracing this fourth session of our year-long uh, Dharampaji webathon, and in particular for taking time out of your busy uh, schedule in the middle of our festive season. Um, my best wishes to all of you on this auspicious occasion. My personal sincere gratitude to the Center for Indic Studies, to its director, Dr. Ram Sharma, and to our pivotal fulcrum, Dr. Ankur Kakkar, for hosting this webathon so efficiently, but also so graciously. It is indeed serendipitous, a fortunate coincidence, that three auspicious events coincide to make today's webinar even more special, namely the ongoing 75th anniversary of Indian independence and the 100th birth anniversary of Shri Dharampal, whose historical work has revolutionized our understanding of India's recent past. But thirdly, and uh, important especially for us today, the, the 50th publication anniversary of his slim but immensely insightful volume, Civil Disobedience in Indian Tradition, published in 1971 by the Sarva Seva Prakashan Varanasi. It is this volume that will be the focus of our discussions this afternoon, whereby we shall be unraveling its historical significance and contemporary implications. Yet, it may seem paradoxical to some of you in the audience that Gandhi's name doesn't figure in the book's title, nor in this session's title. And this absence is perhaps all the more notable since we have only this year completed the two year long celebrations in honor of the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. 
So at the start, to avoid any misunderstanding, I'd like to underscore firstly that Shri Dharampal's work has indeed received great inspiration from Gandhiji. In fact, as a child of the Gandhian era, he considered Gandhi to be um, an avatar who had come to liberate India from oppressive colonial rule. As such, Dharampalji can be viewed as a Gandhian intellectual par excellence. But secondly, and perhaps more significantly, Shri Dharampal, as a critical thinker, appreciated Gandhiji as an exemplary representative of Indian values and understood that it was thanks to his great courage and genius that Gandhiji was able to reinvigorate and revitalize traditional Indian practices, one of which was the practice of civil disobedience, which he called Satyagraha. And to viably reinstate these practices of nonviolent resistance carried out in a most civil but emphatic and forceful manner in the modern context to successfully oppose British colonial rule. In short, the special feature of Shri Dharampal's work was to emphasize the rootedness, <clears throat> the embeddedness of Gandhi's philosophy and praxis in Indian traditions and to refute the generally held assumption that Gandhi had been inspired by Western authors, for instance, in the case of civil disobedience, by the writings of Thoreau or, or Tolstoy. This perspective enables us to appreciate Gandhiji's con contribution even better, even more, uh, as being embedded in Indian traditions. And as such, we as Indians can derive more sustenance and inspiration, not only from Gandhi's achievements, but even more so from the knowledge and realization that our Indian traditions can continue to inspire us, provided we take the trouble to study them in more depth and with sincere commitment, as has been exemplified by Dharampalji's substantial contribution. A final point that I should like to make is the following. Our Indian traditions, uh, such as the practice of civil disobedience, are not static leftovers from bygone days, but constitute dynamic resources, which if understood properly, can serve us excellently to resolve today's problems, as well as to help us shape viable perspectives for our future. With these introductory remarks uh, that I'm sure Professor Satish Jain and Professor Shambhu Prasad are going to elaborate upon magnificently also by having recourse to issues of central relevance for our polity today. Let me hand over to our first speaker, but not before introducing him briefly. Professor Satish Jain is primarily an, an economist. He was on the faculty of the Center for Economic Studies and Planning of the Jawaharlal Nehru University for more than three and a half decades. Besides this, he was Reserve Bank of India Chair Professor from 2011 to 13 and ICSSR National Fellow from 2016 to 18. He has also taught at Shri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi, the Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi and IIT Hyderabad. He has authored several books, among which are uh, Economic Analysis of Liability Rules, published by Springer in 2015, and Domain Conditions and Social Rationality, also published by Springer in 2019. And he has also edited Law and Economics, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2010, and co-edited Economic Growth, Efficiency and Inequality with Anjan Mukherjee, which was published by Rutledge in 2015. 
Satish Jain's teaching and research interests include social theory besides the wide field of law and economics. He is also interested in Gandhian thought, particularly from a civilizational perspective, and of course is intimately familiar with Dharampalji's contributions. That he is also a political philosopher and legal theorist will become apparent from his presentation entitled The Significance of Dharampal's Work for Understanding the Concepts of the Rule of Law and legit Legitimacy in Indian Tradition. Now we look forward to being enlightened by Professor Satish Jain. Satish Ji, the rostrum is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gita Ji. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, prior to Dharampal Ji's uh, work on uh, civil disobedience, as Gita Ji had remarked, uh, generally the understanding was that while Gandhi Ji used civil disobedience on a massive scale, uh, uh, for the first time, the idea was not his. Uh, idea was generally attributed to Henry David Thoreau, uh, who had written a uh, tract called Civil Disobedience in 19th century, and who had been imprisoned uh, by the government of Massachusetts because uh, he refused to pay taxes. The reason why he refused to pay taxes was that he said any government which uh, sanctions slavery is a government which is <clears throat> which in his opinion was illegitimate and there was no question of his paying taxes to such a government. <clears throat> Dharampalji's discovery of a very great mass movement in India against the British during 1810 to 11 in Banaras, Patna, Murshidabad and several other cities conclusively demonstrates that idea of civil disobedience Gandhiji did not borrow from Henry David Thoreau. It is true that Gandhiji had read uh, Thoreau's work Gandhiji was a very truthful person, and if he had borrowed this idea from Henry David Thoreau, he would have mentioned it. What he does is, in Hindu Swaraj, he attributes this idea to Indian tradition. And he says that this has been the tradition of India for a long time. He mentions uh, uh, a particular incident in which uh, the Raja of a, some principality, uh, did something which uh, angered people. So they decided to uh, leave the principality and uh, move to some uh, uh, neighboring principality. So Raja then uh, came with folded hands. He asked for the forgiveness of uh, his subjects and whatever draconian measures uh, he had, uh, he was thinking of uh, promulgating, he withdrew. Uh, Gandhi says this has been our tradition. Whenever uh, a king did something which uh, uh, people did not like, uh, they would protest peacefully. And uh, uh, whosoever was uh, the authority uh, will have to listen to what people were saying. And this was actually <clears throat> to. Uh, Dharampalji's meticulous documentation and his commentary, uh, his uh, analysis of these documents is a very, very important contribution, uh, which throws light not only on the fact that the civil disobedience was practiced in India as early as the first decade of the 19th century, but there are many other things which come out from these documents. So, because one has half an hour's time, uh, 
so it's not possible to discuss everything in detail but there are three four aspects of these documents uh, that i want to discuss the first is that <clears throat> if you read these uh, documents collected by dharampal ji uh, what comes out very clearly is the uh, rapacity and the oppressiveness of the british rule it seems from these documents that in a very short span of time uh, the taxes of various kinds stamp duties this that etc i mean they had been uh, uh, increased uh, 16 fold i mean in a very short time and uh, you actually get a glimpse of uh, <clears throat> the pauperization that was taking place of this country uh, through these taxes and various other measures that the british people had uh, adopted the re extreme rapacity and extreme oppressiveness uh, both <coughs> <coughs> why did this uh, civil disobedience movement take place in uh, uh, banaras to begin with and then spread to other cities uh british people not satisfied with the so many taxes and so many stamp duties and so many uh, manifold increases in various other taxes they decided to impose taxes on houses and shops also now <clears throat> in india uh, prior to the british rule no government uh, Uh, not even when uh, uh, people from uh, outside were ruling uh, this country, uh, had taxes been imposed on shops and uh, houses. This is something totally new. So, uh, <clears throat> from the documents, actually, it comes out in the, the uh, uh, correspondence between the. a british collector of uh, banaras and the governor general <clears throat> in uh, calcutta that uh, again again this point is coming out that it is no not so much the quantum of the tax it is actually the principle of the tax how can you impose a tax on houses i mean something which is where one lives i mean something which is so basic uh, which i mean if one cannot even call one's house one's own uh, then uh, the obviously things have come to such a uh, uh, such a pass i mean so that was the basic point that uh, the <clears throat> indians were making so uh, <clears throat> extreme uh, i will uh, this point is very important so i will come back to it in a slightly different context later so the the first thing that comes out uh, from these documents is extreme rapacity extreme oppressiveness what kind of oppressiveness i mean uh, when you read these documents because the movement continued for uh, off and on for almost a year before it was completely suppressed the extreme brutality and extremely uh, unfair means that the british adopted uh, to suppress this movement uh, uh, again and again you see from this correspondence that the british uh, Uh, officials are uh, re reporting to calcutta and uh, london that uh, uh, anyone uh, supporting uh, the movement and they catch that person uh, uh, people who are uh, go between uh, people who are carrying messages they are caught they are extremely very severely i mean they they are saying in their own words that they are very severely Uh, punished by us so it is extremely oppressive <clears throat> but there is something very fundamental which comes out and i think uh, it is important to talk about this because it has uh, uh, i <clears throat> i believe that uh, if this point is correctly understood then uh, the something that was a very great value in india uh, would become clear you see uh, in order to discuss this point uh, <clears throat> uh, clearly i want to digress a little bit uh, see uh, 
as far as the West is concerned, or now, of course, West is uh, whole of the world, uh, what is the conception of law? The conception of law in the West prior to the Second World War, no matter how many, uh, how, what kind of sophistication was there in theories, what kind of complexity was there in theories, the basic conception was that law is a set of commands issued by the sovereign. The sovereign could, of course, be a one person king. It could be parliament. It could be, I mean, any other body. I mean, uh, the important thing is that the, uh, that is a conception of law. So what is, what is law, lawful is what uh, the, which is uh, in accordance with the commands. And what is unlawful is what is actually against the commands. So that is a, in put it uh, very simply i mean that was the situation <clears throat> now second world war created a uh, major problem because uh, how do you punish uh, uh, those nazi uh, officials who were uh, responsible for the torture of millions of people but who were following commands, I mean, who were following orders of their superior officers. Okay. So uh, the defense of everyone was that they were following the orders of the uh, superior people. So then uh, a new innovation came in the West for the first time. I mean, uh, namely that there is a separate category of crimes, which are crimes regardless of the regime regardless of the law that exists. So like uh, genocide or <clears throat> what, what are called nowadays the crimes against humanity. Uh, so maybe cases of very severe torture or genocide or, and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's go back to the great uh, Satyagraha of 1810 to 11 in Banaras and other cities against the House tax. <clears throat> so uh, there are thousands of people who are collecting and they're completely unarmed. The children are there, women are there. So when they, these officials are reporting, they are saying that these people are completely unarmed, but they're completely, they're not scared at all because they are confident that no military would fire upon them. Uh, no military would fire on unarmed people. <laughs> See, that's a crucial thing. That <clears throat> uh, Indians could not conceive of a situation where unarmed people would be fired upon by, by military. So, that they were wrong uh, <clears throat> with respect to British, I mean, would become clear later. And in fact, that's one of the reasons uh, uh, <clears throat> for a very long chain of events which took place in India. But <clears throat> the significance of this point is that in India, there was uh, a separate category already. So it did not matter what the law was. I mean, it was clear that uh, no legitimate government, a government which is uh, constituted legitimately can ever fire upon unarmed people. You see, I mean, that's it. So, because that would be a crime against humanity and that would make the government illegitimate. Uh, see, so this question of legitimacy, as far as the Indian mind was concerned, the legitimacy of, of a government uh, uh, meant that certain things were not possible by the government. Uh, <clears throat> But as far as the British were concerned, there was no such thing. Okay. So <clears throat> to just look at actually the conception of law and legitimacy in India as early as the beginning of the 19th century and look at the West. I mean, the India was so far ahead uh, uh, in terms of what constituted uh, legitimacy of a state, legitimacy of government. I mean, that conception was, uh, was so far ahead of times. I mean, you know, these ideas would crystallize only after uh, the uh, uh, Second World War. 
I mean, uh, when in fact the need was so great actually to to innovate that something of this kind had to be done. <clears throat> I mean, there's another point. You see, it is true that <clears throat> in today's world, uh, the way uh, law has moved, the way uh, international conventions, etc., and general understanding has moved. Uh, Firing upon unarmed people is, uh, uh, is universally considered repugnant, uh, something which is terrible to be condemned. But incidentally, that has not prevented governments from uh, firing on unarmed people. If you look at actually the history of the world from 1945 to date, you will find that no country in the world has lost legitimacy because they fired on unarmed people. And, uh, and the number of countries which have fired on unarmed people is, is actually not insignificant. <clears throat> which means that although the theory has advanced, I mean, now we have a separate category of crimes, which are crimes regardless of the legal regime, but the practice is not as advanced as it was the case in India. I mean, uh, uh, two and a half centuries back. Secondly, <clears throat> it's not that uh, the kind of crimes which uh, say modern uh, people consider uh, in the separate category, which are to be regarded as crimes uh, regardless of the legal regime. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, the list in India was much larger. This uh, anger against, I mean, after all, as I mentioned, from these documents, it's clear that the British people had imposed so many taxes and had increased uh, taxes to such an extent that already actually uh, the pauperization was taking place, hunger was uh, uh, there, uh, people were extremely oppressed, but they did not resort to Satyagraha simply because of this oppression. It was the house tax which triggered, which means that... Uh, Obviously, certain kinds of taxes, certain kinds of actions were uh, absolutely outside the legitimate uh, boundaries. So, for instance, uh, repeatedly this point is coming out. When you read uh, Dharampalji's documents, uh, they repeatedly this, this point is coming out that uh, the, it's not the quantum of the uh, uh, house tax or the... Uh, uh, tax on shops, it is the principle of the thing, you see. So, <clears throat> I want to actually mention something which uh, I have not checked myself. Uh, this was a private conversation <coughs> with Dharampalji and long time back. So, I hope my memory is not deceiving me. Dharampalji mentioned to me that in India, there was a very long tradition uh, of... Uh, uh, a tax on uh, uh, crops uh, not exceeding one sixth of the produce, and that uh, this was almost inviolable. I mean, there's no question of any 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 government. So I don't know, and because I, as I said, that I. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, if my memory serves, uh, uh, Dharampalji had also mentioned our uh, classical text. My feeling is that possibly uh, uh, in, uh, e even in our uh, story books like Panchatantra, etc., possibly this, uh, this one sixth is mentioned. Anyway, whatever it is. What I'm saying is that this, uh, <clears throat> regardless of this, uh, the uh, correctness or otherwise of this one upon six uh, being the upper limit uh, uh, um, until the British people violated this uh, limit. Uh, there is uh, basically the reason why I mentioned this uh, is that the area uh, where the governments were uh, uh, powerless to do anything, which means the areas that were outside the legitimate functioning of the government. 
that area was very very large it seems to me i mean from 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 the from the readings of these uh, these uh, <clears throat> documents i mean uh, that that kind of a picture is coming out so this is the second second thing that uh, 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 comes out from these documents another thing that comes out is uh, british system of law was uh, essentially lawless see <clears throat> it take any uh, properly enacted law so it has two features uh, among many other features i mean two very important features is one uh, law prohibits uh, uh, certain activities and uh, so that's the first part second part of the law would say that if you uh, indulge in any activity that has been prohibited what is to be the punishment so punishment is described now naturally <clears throat> a uh, legitimate government uh, if it has enacted this law would work within the framework of this law so the government itself would be in violation of this law if it does any of the two things number one it uh, gives a uh, it gives punishment which is uh, uh, greater than what is actually sanctioned in the law because uh, there is a law uh, that says that anyone who violates the law is to be punished th this much secondly <clears throat> if there is a law then uh, yeah, if it says that the violators are to be punished then it must punish all the violators it cannot say that you uh, violate uh, uh, <clears throat> you uh, punish some violators but not not all now what happened is that this house tax business uh, what was the punishment according to law the punishment according to law was confiscation <clears throat> confiscation of property or this or that the most importantly that uh, the law did not prescribe uh, Uh, any uh, uh, torture or any uh, other kind of physical punishment. What did these people do uh, to uh, people who refused to pay taxes? Very brutal treatment. Uh, so, uh, in the in 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 some of these letters, they are mentioning that they they have uh, they. they flogged people so there's a clear violation of their own laws because there is there, there is no mention of floggings there is no mention of any physical uh, punishment as far as the laws is secondly the european residents of uh, uh, various cities including calcutta they refused to pay taxes so these people uh, wrote that uh, europeans are not paying taxes uh, but it is best not to uh, Uh, take any action because there is no way that we can actually collect taxes from them okay. so they are violating they are they are punishing indians indian violators of the law more severely than is uh, sanctioned by law and uh, they are not punishing europeans at all uh, so my feeling is that this uh, uh, this british system Uh, i think if um, uh, more research is done in these things it will come out that it was really completely lawless I and mean, there is actually all these laws that the british people framed um, sole purpose actually was to as i said uh, loot and plunder and uh, so it was a complete uh, uh, to to create a kind of veneer of uh, of law uh, for whatever they wanted to do so uh, <clears throat> we find that uh, there is a great difference between uh, what constitutes uh, legitimacy of a government in india and uh, what constitutes legitimacy there so there's one very fundamental difference another very interesting thing that comes out is again and again from these letters so there is no mention of uh, 
not even a line in all these correspondences whether what they are doing is just unjust fair unfair and uh, no awareness of uh, the wrongs that they are committing what they want they the only word they keep on using for themselves is that the indulgence of the government okay so regardless of what the government does that the people must show respect i mean this is a very strange uh, uh, notion of uh, the relationship between government and the uh, uh, those under the authority of the government and so this uh, <clears throat> Dharampal ji has quoted, uh, in fact, uh, and uh, Jay Prakash ji, who has written the foreword of this book, um, he has also uh, mentioned these things. Um, just like Gandhi ji mentioned that uh, when uh, people in authority do something in India which is not. to the liking of the people then uh, they resort to passive resistance i mean uh, uh, <clears throat> dharampal ji quotes uh, mill uh, so the there's an there's a particular expression that mill has written namely that the <clears throat> indian kings uh, stand in awe of their subjects so that's a very very interesting line a relationship between the authority and the people so if you actually reflect on this uh, you would realize that in a democracy <laughs> the essence of a essence of a democracy is really that the people are <laughs> supreme so it doesn't matter whether people are voting or not voting i mean suppose the you actually have created a polity uh, in which uh, the kings stand in awe of their people <laughs> so and they cannot afford to do anything which would displease people uh, then in the real sense of the term you have a de- democratic system if you actually think about uh, i mean the, the way narratives which have been constructed over the last uh, uh, 200 years they are have become so universal that we are actually not even able to think outside them but <clears throat> the pictures that have the narratives that have been constructed uh, that west uh, has been liberal and democratic and the uh, non west has been undemocratic tyrannical authoritarian and so on so forth. if you <clears throat> if you look at actually uh, the entire anti western uh, history uh, the oppression of people who came up with new ideas this has been a running theme uh, throughout the western history another very important feature of uh, a democratic system is uh, freedom of thought freedom to propagate ideas so so you actually have <clears throat> uh, on the one hand you have indian society so from time immemorial i mean this uh, countless philosophies countless uh, uh, any number of saying saying any number of things i mean going here there propagating whatever and uh, i mean cases of oppression very few i mean cases of intolerance very few uh, look at the west this systematically so I, what i'm saying is that the the narratives are very strange i mean so when you actually look at uh, the indian uh, uh, i mean the picture that is say emerging from uh, dharampal ji's uh, uh, documents so the picture is that of a country in which uh, people feel that no uh, government can actually fire on unarmed people i mean that's a conception 
that no legitimate government can impose this tax or that tax or whatever. I mean, because this is simply just not done. I mean, I mean, this guy, I mean, where are these ideas coming from? Uh, uh, so, so, so what I'm trying to say is that the, we have to figure out, uh, 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 we have to, we have to reflect on actually what these things mean, actually. I mean, uh, so we, uh, on the one we have we have this kind of a situation in one country on where uh, uh, commentators of that period are writing that the kings stand in awe i mean so and uh, and then we talk of uh, uh, authoritarian uh, rule versus democratic rule so we have to reflect on what these concepts mean actually what is democracy and what is authoritarianism uh, <coughs> Uh, because time is short and I don't want to take more than uh, half an hour of allotted time. I just want to conclude uh, <clears throat> by saying that Dharampalji has done a signal service uh, to all Indians by showing us glimpses uh, of what uh, uh, India was like. Uh, I see on I say glimpses because there's much actually which is hidden and uh, uh, glimpses of what India was like uh, prior to the British rule or just immediately after the British rule started. Uh, what we have to figure out is that uh, this uh, Dharampalji kind of work has to be taken forward so that uh, Two very important tasks which should have been done a long time back. Uh, unfortunately, they have not been done. They are now done. One, <clears throat> a more clear picture of what India was like prior to the British rule is required. And that can be uh, obtained only by taking the kind of work that Rampalji did uh, forward. Secondly, we need to... Uh, Look at the distortions that the British people introduced uh, in our society. Distortions and uh, multifarious distortions. And so uh, <clears throat> once, once these distortions created by the British people are understood properly, then I think in some sense, uh, regeneration of the country, the process of regeneration of the country, uh, in some real sense can begin. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Satish Jain for this wonderful talk.